and dies and goes to see Lord Yama. Now, I was just talking about this sutta with a few of the people before, but just uh, when he goes there and, and, and Yama invites him to reflect on his life, he says, what kind of life have you been living? Have you been doing good or doing bad? And he said, well, I was very negligent and very lazy. I didn't have opportunity to do good. And, and then Yama says, but didn't you see the messengers we sent you? Yeah. He says, no, what messengers? He says, well, you know, didn't you see the sick man, you know, the old man, the dead man? Didn't you reflect that I too am of the same nature? The same thing's going to happen to me. I better be, better be diligent. I better do what's good while I have the chance. He said, no, I didn't. And each time he ref- reflects him, he-, he questions him, invites him to reflect, and then at the end of it, uh, King Yama remains silent. And then the demons from hell come up and grab him and drag him down <laughs> for all the punishments. But the, the, the nice thing about that particular kind of story I like is that, that, that Yama's job, like, you know, Yama is, of course, a classic figure in, in Indian mythology. Yeah? He's the, the god of the dead, and like any god of the dead, he's a pretty ferocious figure. Yeah? He's a pretty terrifying figure. But in the Buddhist version, he, he's not terrifying at all, and he's not a judge. Yeah? So we have this idea that after death you're going to be judged, but that's not the Buddhist way of doing it at all. Yama isn't a judge. Yama is an inquirer, yeah? and that's a very, very Buddhist approach to it. So Yama's job is to invite you to reflect on your life. Yeah? not to pass judgment on it, but to invite you to reflect on it. And it's your job to, to uh, reflect on your own life and to see what, what's going to happen to it and to, to um, uh, find, find your own way of living it. And uh, <clears throat> so that's a very Buddhist way of sort of re-envisaging this uh, kind of this mythology. And... Uh, Actually, I heard when I was when I was staying in KL, and we were going at this uh, closer to reality conference, where we were discussing these things. I actually read when I went home, uh, found a, uh, some a Reader's Digest, and it had some jokes in there. And there was actually a joke which encapsulated that difference very well. And the joke the joke was that. I'm a bit nervous about telling jokes in Dhamma talks because I don't want to try to copy Ajahn Brahm too much. It gets too, too, uh, too, uh, too pathetic. And no one can ever challenge his status as the Hasa Raja, the, the, the king of humor. But anyway, man goes in to see the doctor. Doctor, doctor, please help me. You must do something to help me. The doctor says... Of course I will, but you've got to tell me what's the problem. He says, well, doctor, I have a bowel movement every morning at 8 a.m. The doctor says, so? What's, what's the problem with that? Why is that a problem? He says, well, well, doctor, I don't get up until 9. That's our problem, isn't it? We're looking for a doctor to solve our problem. Yeah. Actually, the answer to the problem is fairly straightforward. <clears throat> so this is all these, this idea in, in Buddhism with these, uh, uh, what happens after life and near-death experiences and things like that, is that it's basically it's your responsibility. And uh, when we're thinking about those things and, and talking about them, one thing that's, I think, important from a Buddhist point of view, is, is, is you keep an empirical uh, attitude towards it. That means you stay close to the evidence that's presented, you stay close to the actual data that's presented, and that you're cautious in, in the inferences that you draw from that. Okay? Uh, that and that's, that's a very characteristic about the Buddhist approach. It doesn't mean you can't draw inferences, it just means you're cautious about it and that you, you understand if you're, if you're um, you know, extrapolating from what you're given, that, that there's always a danger of uh, falling into error, or more than a danger, but it's inevitable that you'll, you'll fall into error for some reason. But when we looked at the different kinds of experiences, you know, one of the things that I've noticed about these experiences is that when, when I was a, um, 
we discussed these a bit when I was doing uh, philosophy, <clears throat> and uh, we were discussing things like the, the Christian notion of the soul and so on. And one of the things I noticed is that, that these kinds of experiences are not compatible with the, the classical, if you like, or the Cartesian notion of a soul. Uh, and a soul, according to Cartesian philosophy, is um, an immaterial thing, whatever it is, it's immaterial, it's in op opposition to the body. And uh, so as something which is essentially immaterial, you know, you have these feelings where your soul separates from the body and rises up into the air. Yeah? But, but, but that means it has to have a location, and location is a physical property. Right? You can only define the location of physical things. And similarly, the, 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 the experiencer sees things. They hear things. They can hear what's being said. Yeah? They can see the sights of what's happening. And so that you know, there, there's senses involved, and the senses are essentially physical. Yeah, you have to actually have a physical interaction. You know, to see something, photons have to be involved. Yeah, to hear something, you have to have the the, the sound waves. Yeah, so in some sense, there has to be something physical there, which is able to have a position, it has a location, it can move, and it is in it is capable of experiencing things through the senses and that's that's not what an immaterial soul can be see people when they think about a soul tend to be very uh, fuzzy or very hazy about it you know, as soon as we get into this realm of talking about life after death or something like that then our thinking becomes very very kind of woofily and very vague from a buddhist point of view we should try to keep to the actual uh, evidence what is the actual evidence suggesting so if we take from that experience and we say well it's a it's an eternal soul right which has arisen out of the body well what's your evidence for that what's the evidence that there's anything eternal involved there right all you all you all you can say is that there's it lasts longer than you know the physical body does right the body's dead but the but whatever that is keeps going right <laughs> But that doesn't prove it's eternal. That just proves it lasts. You know, most of these experiences only last a few minutes, right? It's hardly an eternity. Yeah, yeah. Usually only 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 ten minutes or something like that in near-death experiences. So you have so you, there's this kind of great leap from saying, well, there's an experience which seems to last for a few minutes after the death of the physical body, and then this great inference to say, well, therefore it's an eternal soul. Yeah, so this is where Buddhism would would uh, would be cautious about drawing any of those kinds of inferences. That's not to say that the idea of an immaterial eternal soul is <clears throat> the only idea which uh, is current among theistic religions. On the contrary, uh, Islam, as I believe, uh, as asserts the existence of a material uh, survival after death. And uh, in the Bible itself, there's no really clear uh, guidelines as to, I mean, for most, in most of the Bible, actually, there's no clearly um, uh, articulated notion of survival after death in any form. Uh, and in, even in those passages where it does seem to suggest survival of something after death, it never sort of defines what it is particularly clearly. So it's possible to have a spectrum of ideas within sort of Christianity or Judaism about what that is. Uh, but nevertheless, it's commonly assumed that whatever survives after death is immaterial, and that certainly contradicts the evidence. The evidence is that there's some kind of material, whatever it is, that's surviving after death. Now, in Buddhism, you have, uh, in the classic Buddhist text, you have the idea of what they call a manomayakaya, and that means a mind-made body. And it's described as being <clears throat> drawn out of the body like a, uh, a, a sword is drawn out of its sheath, out of its scabbard, yeah? or like a reed is drawn out of a, 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 another one reed, you would draw out of another reed. So the mind-made body is drawn out of this, this body, and it's described as being uh, sabhanga pachangang, which means it's possessed of all its limbs, right? And it's ahin indriyang, means it's uh, not lacking any faculty. So all of its senses are complete. Okay? And that, that's actually a, a remarkably accurate description of what these people who have near-death experiences actually describe, what they experience. They experience some kind of body, 
right? It's some kind of physical thing, but maybe like an energetic or something thing, how you describe it. It has all its limbs, right? So they describe, you know, it's not, it's not just a, a sort of a, you know, a sphere or something like that. It actually has limbs and is shaped like the body and it has all its senses intact. So you can, hearing is intact, vision is intact and so on and so forth. So that description of the mind-made body as found in the Buddhist texts is in fact a very um, accurate and straightforward description of the experiences that people have near-death experiences and, and other, other out-of-body experiences and so on, what they describe. Okay? And so that's, from a Buddhist point of view, that's what I mean again by, by st stopping short with the evidence. Yeah? Or, you know, I'm not saying stopping short with it, I'm not saying you can't reflect on it and, and so on, but just not, not going too far away from the evidential base. Okay? So if we can then say, well, it seems to be, if we can accept that hypothesis, then it seems to be that some kind of, let's call it an energy body or a subtle body, well, what kind of energy is involved, right? So, so Buddhism doesn't tell that, us that. The Buddhist texts aren't clear in saying, well, it's, you know, defining what kind of thing is involved, what is the process, all of those things are not uh, defined for us in too much detail, although there are some details found, especially in the Tibetan and, and Chinese texts. <clears throat> so that's, you know, that's then an object of further inquiry, and it's then up to, you know, to do some experiments to say, well, if... And then, then, then you can then frame a hypothesis. So you can say, at a near-death experience, the person who has that describes the feeling of raising out of the body. They can, in that experience, they can then see and hear things, right? So in some ways, they're interacting with the physical world, right? Which suggests that there must be some kind of physical presence or some kind of physical... Um, phenomenon which is available there and which is interacting with the world and so in principle there should be some way of testing that right so there's in principle there should be some way that that you could you know see whether there is in fact some kind of setup to do some kind of uh, experimental setup to see whether that corresponds with some uh, sort of observation of of um, uh, an energy or something like that in the room and I think that that uh, kind of thing could be done in principle, whether it's been, you know, whether it's practical and whether it actually has been done are two different matters. Uh, <clears throat> one thing which is kind of relevant in that uh, is what they call Curlean photography, where they take photographs of like some kind of energy or aura around people and plants and so on. And one of the most Radical findings of, of Curlean photography is that when, if you say, if you have a, a leaf and you, and you photograph it, it has a, has a field, you can see the, the light glowing in different colours around it, but then if you break a part of that off, then it'll still keep the shape of the original leaf or the original thing, yeah? So that the energy body has a certain kind of form which, in a sense, um, uh, can continue after the after the physical the physical thing is broken, at least for a period of time. Obviously, it lasts for a period of time and then then decay. So, again, that that kind of connects with that idea of being complete in all the limbs. Yeah. So this idea that the 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 the, 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 the energy body, uh, which is normally kind of mapped onto our physical body, our, our coarse material, our coarse physical body itself contains a replica of our limbs. You know, it's, it's, it's something like the intern, our internal image of our body, which we can see. So this was uh, some of the things we talked about. And one of the things which, um, again, I was just talking with a few people earlier, but I, I would just kind of re repeat what I was saying then. One of the things which is, I found very striking when sort of looking at the literature on these things and, and reviewing what people had to say was how closely these experiences uh, mapped onto the Buddhist teaching on the five aggregates. Okay, So just again to review the, the classic experience, right? the, almost like the cliché of the out-of-body experience. So remembering that actually out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences, all of these things actually are very varied. They don't follow one particular path. Okay, they tend to have patterns which are, you know, similar, 
but there's many, many variations in the details, okay? Uh, and also it depends on what kind of source that you're using, whether it's, you know, if it's people who've been, had a near-death experience, uh, you know, from under surgery or something, or is it children who've recollected their past lives or something, so they'll tend to give different, different kinds of experiences. But in the um, uh, classic sort of out-of-body experience or near-death experience, the first thing that they, they notice is that the you know, feeling of rising out of the body. Right? So you, you, you sort of rise out and you look down and people are usually surprised. They see themselves lying down there, on the, say, on the, the uh, operating table. Yeah? And, uh, <clears throat> and they can see... Yeah? And so on. So there's a f that physical dimension. The first thing that becomes apparent is the physical dimension, which of course is what in Buddhism we call rupa khanda. Okay, it's the first of the five aggregates. Is the aggregate of form. Now rupa khanda is often explained as being the physical body, right? So often we say rupa just means the body, but actually that's it's much more subtle than that, right? What rupa means is essentially any kind of physical phenomena which is perceivable by the mind, right? Is fits into the rupa khanda. So not just the body, but also any sense object, anything which you see, hear, uh, smell, taste, touch, these also are rupas, but also things which are derived from those which are experienced in the mind are also rupa. So, for example, if you, if you recollect an image of your home, that image in your mind is also a rupa. It comes under the rupa khanda. So rupa khanda is very broad. Uh, and much more subtle than our, our idea of matter is from a, a Western perspective. So that kind of energy body or mind-made body uh, that that uh, has been described would would uh, fall under what we call the rupa kanda. And one of the um, the things which the scientists are trying to do is to uh, uh, find proof that uh, these experiences do in fact involve a genuine experience out of the body and are not just the result of some kind of brain malfunction or something. So some of the research which has been done, uh, especially on uh, jet pilots, they get, they get pilots and they subject them to very high G-forces and then when they're, they're, their brains are deprived of oxygen and then they experience these lights and things that are like near-death experiences. And so the, 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 the you know, the, 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 the rebuttal is that, that this is not an actual, you know, it's got nothing to do with a, with a you know, out-of-body experience or anything like that. It's simply the images which the mind tends to cook up for itself when the brain is de deprived of oxygen, right? And I don't, know, I don't know whether there's something to that. I don't know whether it's related to meditation in any way because you also get, when you're meditating, also your breath gets very subtle, yeah? You're hardly breathing at all and then you get these bright lights that come into your mind, yeah? So maybe meditation is nothing more than oxygen deprivation as well. I don't know. But, uh, <clears throat> so this is, this is one of the critiques of the near-death experience, yeah? And it's an, it's an important thing to consider, you know? When we're listening to accounts, people give us accounts of these things, they're very subjective, yeah, they're just describing their subjective experience and it's very difficult to know how that relates to our ordinary experience. And the, you know, the, the position of the, I guess, the, the scientific establishment would be that, well, you know, we've got, we've got this vast kind of mountain of evidence and information about our material world and all of that suggests or confirms the idea that, that the phenomenon that we see around us, the phenomena of life and so on and so forth, can be explained by reference to ordinary physical processes and the laws of physics and the laws of biology and so on and so forth. And if we're going to introduce a radically new principle into that whole structure, then we're going to need strong evidence for it. Yeah? We're not just going to do it lightly. And so scientists tend to be quite defensive, not all scientists, but a lot of scientists tend to be quite defensive about that and try to look, uh, would require very hard evidence before acknowledging that. So one of the ways that they try to provide that hard evidence is by finding somebody who can uh, remember some kind of experience which either happened at a time when they were actually brain dead yeah, or some kind of experience which they couldn't have known about without leaving their body. And there are various anecdotes of these kinds of things, like people who can remember remarks and things that were said while they were brain dead. 
uh, but it's then, of course, very hard to measure that exactly. And, of course, you're in, a, you're in an emergency environment in an operating theatre, right? The, the doctors are trying to save someone's life. They're not you know, looking at the clock to see, well, at what exact moment did I make that remark, right? So then somebody comes out and they say, I heard you make that remark. Well, was that actually at the time when they were measure, you know, measurably brain dead or not? Well, it's not easy to, to work that out, yeah? So it's not easy to, to find these things out. And so there's various anecdotes for example, the anecdote of the 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 nurse who who uh, lost her glasses, you know, during an emergency in the operating theatre, and then the the patient was said to, her, oh, you you put them on top of the cabinet, you know, they're on top of the cabinet, and then they they saw them while they're having their out of body experience, place their glasses on top of the cabinet, and then the nurse finds them, yeah. So there are various anecdotes like that, but it's hard to rely on anecdotes. So they actually ongoing doing one experiment in an operating theatre. Uh, where they <coughs> uh, have a, um, a random word generator. So it's like an LED display that uh, generates random words and that's placed on top of a cabinet in the operating theatre room. Yeah? And so it's only visible if someone's floating up near the ceiling of the operating theatre. And so their idea is that if someone has an out-of-body experience or a near-death experience, they'll float up and they'll see that and it's generating random words. So nobody knows what the words are that are on there, but they're all recorded. Yeah? So if then they come back and they report seeing those words and then they can look at the time and see when those words came up, so then that would be a good piece of evidence, yeah? Fortunately, no one's actually had any out-of-body experiences since they've been running the experiment, yeah? So they're still waiting on that one, yeah? So no, no results for that particular one yet. But always have to be patient with these things. Remember Democritus? proposed the theory of the atom. It was at 300 BC or something like that. And so it wasn't until the end of the 19th century that they were able to confirm that. Not more than 2,000 years to confirm it. And then when they confirmed it, they said, well, yeah, kind of, but kind of not. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't exactly as Democritus proposed. So these are some the aspects of the, the, the rupa, of the physical aspect of what's going on. And as, as I mentioned before, I don't see there's any reason why, you know, there shouldn't be some kind of electromagnetic radiation or some kind of energy or something that's associated with that, and that shouldn't be in principle detectable. Uh, whether we can do that practically speaking is, is another matter. Uh, so, physical, but then the other thing is that, of course, everyone, ex then, then when they come out of the body, you know, the very next thing that they say is that they have these great feelings of bliss. Yeah? So they feel tremendously light, they feel buoyant, all of the pain has vanished away from, you know, and they feel it's a very blissful experience. And most people experience death as something very pleasant. And this is also applies to the, um, uh, the children who recollect their death as well. Uh, and most of them uh, say, you know, I can remember one, one of Ian Stevens's cases and this little girl who drowned and she recollected her death by drowning, you know, and then when, when she died, you know, she felt perfect, you know, perfectly fine, you know, felt perfectly happy. And the, the, the experimenter said, well, was there anything unpleasant about the experience? And, and she said, well, the only thing that was unpleasant was that my mummy and daddy were, very, were crying. Yeah, so I felt sad for my, my family because they were so upset, but actually I was fine. <laughs> so there's all those feelings. And of course, feelings is Vedna Kanda. Yeah? So this is also the, the um, second of the five aggregates, yeah? Vedana. And so all of these feelings come under the Vedna Kanda. The third part of the, the, third, the third of the five aggregates is the Sanya Kanda, is perception. And perception has to do basically with how we filter and interpret uh, our sense data and make sense of the world which, which, you know, which we're immersed in. And so it involves things like being able to recognize. Yeah? So that's how we filter and recognize. So you recognize people's faces, for example. Yeah? And so that's, of course, what, what, what then happens at the next stage of, of the, the adventure is that a you know, bright light appears and then you go down the tunnel and then you meet relatives and so on who've passed away or whatever, and so you're actually you're recognizing. Yeah? And so obviously sanya is involved, perception is involved there. To, there's some connection between what's happening there and what's happening in your life. And then when you meet these people, then you have a choice. right? You have a choice. Do I go on or do I come back? 
And of course, the, not everyone has a choice, but often they have a choice. And obviously, the stories that we hear are of the people who chose to come back. Right? Uh, and... Oh, yeah, I should, should come back to the, the, the question of sanya that comes up to us, something we mentioned earlier, is also is... Um, like most of the people who can recollect their past lives and so on seem to recollect them as humans, right? Whereas, of course, in Buddhism, uh, you know, you can be reborn in many different forms, animals and different kinds of beings and ghosts and all these kinds of things, devas and so on. And so why do people only recollect human births? So, you know, again, that's a subject for, for further, further inquiry and further testing, but two reasons immediately suggest themselves. One is that uh, for the most part, we get reborn where our attachments lie. Yeah? And so if we're in the human realm, we're attached to the human realm, yeah? uh, and so we tend to get reborn. And not only do we tend to get reborn as humans, we tend to get reborn in the same family or the same country, or you know, if not in the same family, in a very close one, or you know, a close village and so on. But that also connects with the second part of it is that um, the, uh, how, how, how do we recognize what's been in our past life and what's not? Yeah? Uh, and how do we make sense of that experience? Yeah? Maybe if we were a Brahma in our past life, right? so we just lived in a realm of bliss and light, how would we describe that? Yeah? Well, some people do, actually. There are some people who uh, describe, I've heard some of the, the, the rishis and so on who, who say that they just were born in this, this, this realm and that's what their life was just like. Their mind was just full of light and love and, and, and luminous consciousness from, from the first that they could remember. Yeah? So that's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah? And so that would be like someone who's come down from a Brahma realm. Uh, and other people you know, maybe have very kind of coarse and very animalistic minds and things like that. But of course, you, it's difficult to relate to those things. Yeah. So you know, imagine if you've been born a rabbit in your past life. Yeah. Well, what's being a rabbit like? Yeah. What's it like to be a rabbit? What's it like to be a cockroach? Yeah. It's very difficult to, for us to relate to those things. So it probably would just manifest in terms of maybe you know certain emotional responses or something like that, rather than a sort of concrete idea of what they were. But also remember that children tend to forget these things. And that you can only really confirm it if it's if it's local. Yeah. So you know, if someone was reborn in Sri Lanka and then the next life they're born in America, well, how do you find the original family? You can't do it. You can only confirm, and even then it's difficult. You can only confirm in a local area. So there's many reasons why the the evidence is self-selecting. So you tend to select in in those regions that are closer to you and those realms of rebirth that are closer to you. So, perception and then choice. So this is sankhara khanda, yeah, and that's precisely what sankhara means. Sankhara means making a choice. Yeah, where are you going to go? What direction is your life going to go in? And so it's a choice. And then the last uh, of the khandas is vinyana. Vinyana khanda means conscious, or they translate as consciousness. But the most, you know, one of the most overwhelming aspects of all of these descriptions is that they're entirely lucid. Yeah? There's, a, the, there's, a, there's, a, there's a great clarity of awareness during the whole process. You know exactly what's happening all the way through the process. And, of course, that's exactly what Vijnana Khanda is. It's the clear awareness of what's happening. So uh, the descriptions match the five Khandas very, very closely. In fact, I think they match the, the description of the five khandas suspiciously closely. Yeah? And I think that the, 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 the relationship between the two it may well be more than coincidental. And I think maybe what's happening is that the actual the, the, the Buddhist description of the five aggregates partly has evolved out of these kinds of experiences. Yeah? out of people's near-death experiences and so on, and then they say, oh, this, they identify with it. They, this is my soul, this is myself, this is my Atman. I felt my Atman, it was like this. Yeah? And so these all became incorporated within the five aggregates as part of the description of what these things happening without, of course, the, 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 the philosophical assumptions 
brought to the, the idea of the Atman. As I mentioned before, in Buddhism we stay close to the evidence. So the Atman or the self is assumed to be something that's permanent or eternal. There's nothing in that experience is permanent. Right? You look at all of that experience, what's, what, what is permanent about it? There's nothing permanent. It's a changing experience. Yeah? It's all conditioned. Yeah? And uh, so there's nothing in there which you can sort of grasp onto as a, uh, um, as a um, soul or as an Atman, as an eternal essence. One of the other uh, aspects of the, the experience which people often report is a sense of meaning. Uh, a sense that there is a purpose to what they're doing to their life, um, and that the, the, their choice to either you know leave their life or to come back to their life is influenced by their sense of purpose. You know, they they they, they die. They have all these blissful feelings. Yeah, they just want to, you know, go to heaven or wherever it is they're going. But they kind of reflect on their life and they realize they've got unfinished business. Yeah, and so they want to sort of go back to that. And so that idea of having unfinished business is not um, exactly found in the Buddhist texts in exactly that same way. But it is uh, uh, not dissimilar to that uh, process I mentioned before with uh, the interview with King Yama. Yeah? And so sort of reflect on what, what is the actual process and how you lived your life. Yeah? And to, to try to understand, well, what's the, what's the best way to live your life? Um, and so it's not, yeah, I think it's not, uh, not, not too dissimilar from that. So the, the uh, conclusion which I kind of drew from, from all of this stuff is that uh, I think that the Buddhist or the early Buddhist description of life after death and so on is in fact very congruent with the most of the data which we've got from these various empirical sources. The data don't prove uh, every detail of the Buddhist theory of life after death by any means. And in particular, they don't prove the existence of um, rebirth in different realms, and nor does it prove um, the notion of karma, of ethical cause and effect. Okay, uh, but neither does it disprove those things. So they're still open questions uh, as far as the scientific evidence is concerned. So uh, I think that's that's uh, encouraging. Um, certainly not the final word on the matter, and so it's one it's an area where hopefully there's a lot of room for for more research and so on.